Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Now in this video, we'll be looking at the second of our two videos into designing an experiment. And this one is all about the different types of experiment that you can do. Now, before we get into this guys, a quick apology. I did say in my last video that the next one would be up ASAP. That one was over six months ago, but in my defense, I have had a child in that time. So uh, Little Flora has taken up quite a lot of my time. Um, but uh, we're back into this and hopefully again, we get the rest of these psychology videos up in time for the May exam. So let's dive straight in and work out what different types of experiments there are. First things first is we have to decide what type of experiment that we want to do. Now the thing about psychology is that every single experimental option has really just kind of two outcomes here. Either we conduct it in a controlled environment, which we will for convenience call the lab, or we conduct that in a natural environment. And again, for convenience, we will call that the field. Now, if I was to ask you to draw up in your mind what you thought a lab looked like, it would probably look not too dissimilar from this image here, right? A scientist standing there with bubbling test tubes and lab coats and all sorts of machinery whirring away in the background. It's not quite the case for psychology though. A lab experiment is quite simply any experiment that's conducted in a controlled artificial environment. So we ask our participants to come out of their natural habitat and into a universe of our creation. Now there's no universally agreed standard for what a lab should look like. So typically it's just going to be a plain room with no distractions in it. It's probably best if it doesn't have a window in it as the researcher can't really control what might happen outside. We might have a car crash happen or somebody quite interesting might walk past or there might be an alien landing or something like that. We simply don't know that anything that does happen outside would be a distraction. Now, a typical lab experiment would be conducted in a small room, something kind of like this picture you can see here, typically a computer on a simple desk, something like that. Now, of course, there are going to be some lab experiments that might need more elaborate apparatus, but generally speaking, if you're asked to do some lab experiments, then this is what it will look like. If we do decide to go for a lab experiment, then, well, what are the good things behind that? One of the main advantages of lab experiments is that environmental variables are controlled. This means there are no distractions around the outside world. Typically speaking, random error is reduced. We change one thing about our participants' environment and we measure that effect on another. What else could it possibly be? If we have controlled that environment to the utmost, the utmost ability that we have, then there should be no random error and we should have no environmental variables. However, the downside of this, though, the big disadvantage, is that being in any artificial environment means a lack of ecological validity. So what if you have proved something in a laboratory? Does that matter? So a human behaves that way in the lab that you've created. But would a human behave that way normally in their own home or at school, at university, at work? We simply don't know that. So therefore, lab experiments, ultimately, they're quite interesting, but they have a severe lack of ecological validity. Now, the opposite of a lab experiment is something called a field experiment. Again, if I asked you to conjure up in your mind what a field looked like, you'd think of a nice leafy green meadow with some cows happily dozing away in the background. That's not a field experiment. A field is just any environment that's a participant's natural environment. So it could be a home, that would be nice and natural, school, work, university, a shopping centre, etc, etc. It's basically any place apart from the laboratory that we've created for it. Now, you can see here, this is uh, an image I've just pulled from Google Images, it's child psychology. You can see here why we might prefer to use a field experiment for something like child psychology. A child is never going to behave normally, not even close to normal, if you bring them out of their habitat and put them into a lab, a cold, scary, sterile lab with a computer whirring away in the corner, a nasty, scary man in a lab coat writing things down on a clipboard. So you take the experiment to them, you take the experiment to their natural environment and you study them in their own place of safety. And the reason that we do that 
is simply to get rid of all the problems of a lab experiment. So it's likely for you guys this year, the vast majority of research that you'll be doing will be a field experiment for that reason. As well as that, it's simply more convenient. It's too difficult to put together a proper lab, so we'll do some field experiments instead. If we do decide to go for a field experiment, then what are the advantages of that? Well, essentially, if you know the advantages and disadvantages of a lab experiment, then you know exactly the same thing for field experiments. It's the same thing in reverse. The main advantage is that ecological validity is high. Participants behave that way and they're in their natural environment. So that makes sense that they're going to behave that way normally. That's a huge advantage for us. Disadvantages though, logically, is that environmental variables are not controlled. It might be that the difference in temperature that you've changed in the environment is having the effect on your participants. Or it might be the gallon of fizzy juice that they've just drunk at the same time. You couldn't control that and therefore you simply don't know. As well as that, random errors are far more likely in the participant's natural environment, simply because you have no control over it. So how do we know what had the effect? Was it your IV or was it something completely different? We simply don't know. So lab and field experiments are your two main types of experiments. But psychology is quite interesting. We have two other types of experiment as well. One of these I'd like to tell you about is something called a quasi-experiment. Quasi is a word that means something like partial or partially, something like that. And that's a nice way to think about it. A quasi-experiment is a sort of true experiment. You change an IV and you measure the effect on the DV. But in this case, the IV is usually fixed and out with our direct control. Now that might sound a little bit obtuse and a little bit scary to get your head around. Let me give you a couple of examples. What about something about gender? We're interested in the difference between males and females on one particular DV. Now we couldn't change that, right? We can't change somebody's gender. They're either male or female. So we've got no control over that, but we can still measure the effect on the DV. Therefore, gender in an experiment is a quasi-experiment. What about something like extroverts versus introverts? You can't change someone's personality. They're either extrovert or introvert or any other personality difference. We can't control that, but we can measure the effects of those things on a DV. Again, quasi-experiment. A last example, what about vegetarians and meat eaters? Someone's either vegetarian or they're not. You can't change that. That's their own personal choice. But we can measure the effect, the difference between vegetarians and meat eaters on something else. But the thing is about a quasi-experiment, because we can't really control the IV, that means the participants are in pre-existing groups. We haven't randomly allocated them into anything, which is a big flaw. It means ultimately that there's no randomizations of extraneous participant variables as well. So it might just be that our vegetarians have a better score on their IQ test. But what if it was just that just through chance our vegetarians had a bigger group of super geniuses? Because we haven't randomly allocated, we haven't gotten around that problem. So therefore, it could be another confounding variable. The last type of experiment I want to tell you about here is something called a natural experiment. Now, this is quite an interesting one. A natural experiment is sort of an experiment, but neither the IV nor the DV is controlled by the experimenter. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, what's actually happening then if the experimenter is not doing anything? Well, that's a good question. The experimenter has simply noticed that something is changing so kind of an IV, something in the world is changing, and then they're interested in that effect on something else. So it's kind of like the universe is changing an IV and the DV is changing with it. So we just simply notice that and we write down what happens. I'll give you an example for this one. In 1972, a psychologist called Knuckles and his colleagues studied the effects of high or low levels of social support on the health of women who were stressed during pregnancy. So the pregnant women had a diagnosis of stress, but the difference between them was that some of them had a really high level of social support. They had family and friends to call on. Some women, unfortunately, didn't have any of that. They didn't really have family to call on. They didn't really have friends to call on either. 
Now, what they did here was studied women who naturally experienced either a high or low level of stress. And you can see why they did that. It would have been hugely unethical to deliberately cause stress to pregnant women. We can't do that. It's really, really bad for them. But the thing is, we just noticed that they have that difference. We didn't change that. We just noticed it. The researchers also didn't provide that social support. That was nothing to do with us. They just kind of had family and friends or didn't have family and friends. Again, those variables were naturally occurring. Nothing to do with us. We just noticed the difference. Now, in this knuckle study, it's possible to treat social support like the IV and any health outcomes that the pregnant women have, the effect on them or their baby, like a dependent variable. But it's really important to remember that with no control, like this experiment here, and no random allocation, it's not really an experiment at all, is it? Confounding variables can't be ruled out, and we can't really be certain that one variable caused a change in the other. It's interesting, for sure, but ultimately, that's all it is. It's not a true experiment, so we can't really tell anything from it. Hope that's all clear, guys. So we've got four key concepts from this one to learn. Lab experiments, field experiments, those are the two main types. And then you've got these two weird ones at the end, quasi-experiments and natural experiments as well. If you can get your head around what these four different types of experiments are, then you are on to an absolute winner. Thanks very much for your attention, guys. In the next video, we're going to be looking at non-experimental methods. This is another way for us to learn things in psychology. But until then, guys, I hope you're all well, and I hope you're doing great in your psychology revision. Cheers!